Welcome back everyone to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. I'm happy to read with you today Canto 19 of Paradiso, Dante's Paradiso. It's one of those cantos from which we can see Dante's universality and modernity more than from others, very much here. The theme that Dante develops in this canto is that of the divine justice. We remember from Canto 18 we've seen the huge vision of the golden eagle, which represents divine justice, is made of the different souls of the just, the just souls. So we know that we are in the sixth heaven, the heaven of Jupiter, and uh, we will be uh, in Canto 20 as well. So 18, 19, and 20 are kind of a single narrative, narrative unit. Some commentators and some scholars uh, found it a little strange that in this Canto 19, Dante, yes, he talks about uh, earthly justice as well, but he spends a lot of time and a lot of tercets in trying to elucubrate on a very specific theological point. Personally, I am with the other scholars who say that this makes a lot of sense for Dante to have focused on this theological point because he's really talking about both types of justices, the human justice and divine justice, and one really fully depends on the other. Therefore, if divine justice wasn't fully perfect, then human justice could not be fully perfect. And this is uh, the tension that Dante is coming from. He wants divine justice to feel to him, to his intellect, fully perfect. And he has one last question or one last problem to pose to God, to the divine souls that he has in front of him before he feels uh, uh, fully okay about the perfection of divine justice. This is the most fascinating point of this canto. So what is this question? What, what's this question that Dante has been obsessing for a long time? Because in the canto he will say, I've been hungering around this point for a long, long time. He will highlight how more important than others this theological question is for him, to him. The question is the question of uh, salvation of the non-Christians. In Canto IV of Inferno, Dante already expressed this concern about uh, the fact that walking around the limbo, he could see people like children, for example, who had no fault of their own at all, but yet they were still in hell. And uh, it took the, almost the entire Divine Comedy to get to this Canto 19 and then 20 to get to a proper um, resolution of this point, a proper development. And this is why the question is presented by Dante with such delicacy, with such importance and solemnity. He's asking, how is it possible that God is just if somebody who hasn't known Christ without their own fault is not saved? Justice, of course, was a very, very near and dear thing to Dante because of how he was, he had been treated by Florence. But uh, as soon as he poses the question, which we will see in the, uh, the roundabout way in which the question is actually posed, the divine ego, instead of uh, uh, limiting itself to give to Dante only the answer that Dante had written in his De Monarchia, in Canto 19 and 20, he will not stop at the faith argument, which is the, let's say, powerful but simple argument that no human being can see into the divine will, so we cannot understand it. This is true, powerful, but for Dante is not intellectually cogent. He wants something more, and therefore here he goes beyond and uh, he will also receive from the ego some rational arguments that satisfy him much more and that can also satisfy, satisfy us modern people today as well, not only modern Christians but uh, modern non-Christians. The canto starts very slow and solemn. Parea dinanzi a me con l'ali aperte, la bella image che nel dolce frui liete facevan l'anime concerte. Parea ciascuna rubinetto in cui Raggio di sole ardesse si acceso che nei miei occhi rifrangesse lui. Really beautiful, very elevated um, language 
a lot of Latin and Latinisms here. In fact, there is pure Latin in this frui, which is at the end of the second line, which is an uh, infinite of a verb, uh, of a Latin verb that means to enjoy. However, this is interesting. He is uh, sourcing uh, literally and very specifically from uh, St. Augustine, from the Civitate Dei here, where St. Augustine had distinguished frui from uti, which are both um, infinite Latin verbs. But St. Augustine said, frui is the enjoyment of the divine things, of the spiritual things, while uti is the enjoyment of uh, the earthly, earthly things. So Dante is really quoting St. Augustine here with this frui. Liete facevan l'anime concerte. Each of these souls, extremely beautiful, is like a ruby inside of the, of the eagle. There are basically three miracles that he's describing here that uh, are impossible to believe. You wouldn't believe it if I, if I had, I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it. That's what Dante is telling us. The first miracle is the beak of this eagle is moving as the eagle, talk, as the eagle talks, as if this formation was in fact an actual, a real bird, which obviously is not. The second miracle is the fact that Dante heard the eagle talk with uh, a human voice, and he could hear the words come out of the eagle with a human voice. And the third and more important, most important miracle is the fact that Dante, as he explains here, eh, chi io vidi e anche udì parlar lo rostro e sonar nella voce e io e mio quando era nel concetto e noi e nostro. He is uh, hearing the eagle speak to him in the singular form with the uh, uh, I form while the concept in the thinking is meant to be plural. This e pluribus unum type of, it's a famous Latin motto that means from the, from the many, just one. I think it's one of the United States mottos as well. Signifies um, divine justice, the fact that uh, all these souls of the just are speaking in unison because divine justice speaks with just one voice. It's God speaking through their voices. So the eagle begins to talk. E cominciò, per essere giusto e pio, son io qui esaltato a quella gloria che non si lascia vincere a disio. It's very interesting to see how the eagle is speaking in the singular form. But Dante, when he talks to the eagle, he says you in the plural, like almost to say you guys, to highlight even more this discrepancy between their multiplicity and the singularity of what they are and how they speak. Interesting how in line uh, uh, 18, Dante says, Commendan lei, ma non seguon la storia. Even the, the bad, unjust, and evil people on earth are um, admiring the souls of these kings and princes and emperors who are part of this ego. However, non seguon la storia. They don't follow the history. There is another Latin motto, which is historia magistra vite. The history is a master for life. We should learn from history for our present. But we all know that, unfortunately, historia, it's not very often magistra vita. It's almost the opposite. We keep making the same mistakes. And this is what Dante is alluding to, um, for, especially for unjust people. History does not, has not this ability to teach them what is right and what the right direction is. I feel like there is so much to say about this canto. I don't want to bypass or skip any of the terces because each one is so beautiful. Like this one at 19, for example. Così un sol calor di molte brage si fa sentir come di molti amori usciva solo un suon di quella immagine. If I had to think about a simile to say, to remark on uh, a situation like this, a uh, sound that comes out out of many different voices as just one voice, I would spend all my life thinking about a simile and I would never find one as beautiful as this one which in English is uh, one soul warmth is felt from many embers. It's incredible because it gives you also the, the good feeling, the good feeling of the warmth coming from the voice of, uh, of the divine, the eagle of divine justice. So here we have Dante talking to the eagle and he says, uh, Solvete me, resolve please for me, spirando il gran digiuno. Here is where he's really highlighting how important and how 
more important than others, this theological question is for him, and it's been for a long time. Let's remember, since Inferno 4, he has expressed this concern, obviously because he cares about Virgil, but he cares about many other people. He was in love with the classics. He cares about all those people, and he cares about the concept, the principle of, of divine justice. So he has this uh, grandi Juno, which uh, Mandelbaum translates as hungering, this great fast which kept me hungering for so long, che lungamente mantenuto infame. In fact, if he, if he wasn't enough, Dante is repeating this again at verse 32 and 33. He says, sapete qual è? You already know which one is it is that doubt, il dubbio, che me di giunco tanto vecchio. Cotanto vecchio means it's so ancient for, my, for me, for my life. This particular doubt is been obsessing me. It's very, very, very important for me. On verse 29, Dante says, La divina giustizia fa suo specchio, se in cielo altro reame, this uh, other realm in heaven that is mirroring divine justice is the one of Saturn. Um, but still, Dante is saying, you guys are reflecting perfectly the voice of God when it comes to divine justice. So I'm finally in the right place to ask this question. And uh, he's not saying what this question is here in, in this third set. He's, he's not even saying it. He we will need to, we poor readers, will need to wait for the ego to articulate the question. It's just splendid how Dante characterizes the, the golden eagle as a very important character, as, which it is. It's a very, very crucial, important character. But instead of simply, he could have just simply described the dialogue between him and the eagle. But no, the eagle in this canto becomes a living, breathing, moving, and gyrating and dancing character. In verse uh, 34, quasi fal falcone che esce del cappello, Move la testa e con l'ali si plaude. Poi cominciò, verse 40. Colui che volse il sesto allo stremo del mondo, who is God, e dentro adesso distinse tanto occulto e manifesto. Is the, God is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. Uh, Dante is replicating here the words of the Christian creed, of all things visible and invisible. We believe, etc. Non poté suo valor si fare impresso in tutto l'universo che il suo verbo non rimanesse in infinito eccesso. Simple concept, but very profound for Christian theology. Il suo verbo is, uh, verbo means verb or word, the word of God, but in the sense of the, the idea, the divine idea. It was impossible for, for the divine idea to impress itself uh, wholly in God's creation. Uh, without leaving some uh, of this eternity that God is um, aside. So creation is, is uh, showing only a part of, of what God is. E ciò fa certo che il primo superbo, il primo superbo is Lucifer, che fu la somma d'ogni creatura, per non aspettar lume cadde acerbo. Um, he wasn't waiting for the light, he wasn't waiting for the light of grace, of divine grace. He wasn't patient and the uh, sin of pride, and therefore he fell. Now, we get to verse uh, 52, um, where uh, the eagle is saying that our intellectual sight, uh, the, the eyes of our mind, basically, as human beings, which is only a few of the rays, that, the, the, the rays of light of God's mind, it's only a very, a very small part, non po da sua natura essere possente tanto che suo principio non discerna molto di là da quel che le parvente. Of its own nature cannot find sufficient force to see into, into its origin beyond what God himself makes manifest to man. Here is already a prelude to what the faith part of the answer to Dante will be. It's very important to introduce this very delicate theological question and problem by reminding Dante of the limits, the limitations of, of our brain, of our mind, compared to the divine. And uh, as if to remark on this concept, but in a beautiful, poetic way, Dante gives us, once again, because he's already been talking about the depth of the sea 
and looking at the sea a couple of times before in the comedy, he gives us this beautiful looking at the sea um, simile. We can certainly see some. We can see the bottom when we are near to the to the beach, but uh, as we go in the high seas, it's impossible for us to see the bottom. The bottom is there, he's saying, but we cannot see it. So finally, we get to Dante's question, which is articulated by the ego. We are on line 70. Che tu dicevi, un uomo nasce alla riva dell'Indo, e quivi non è chi ragioni di Cristo, né chi legga, né chi scriva. E tutti i suoi voleri e atti buoni sono, quanto ragione umana vede, senza peccato in vita o in sermoni. Muore non battezzato e senza fede. Ov'è questa giustizia che il condanna? Ov'è colpa sua se egli non crede? What kind of fault does he have if he doesn't believe in this situation? The man who is sitting on the Hindu's banks and for no fault of his own is ignorant of the revelation of Christ. Here what we can do is to divide the what remains of the canto, starting from line 79, in two um, important parts. The first one goes from line 79 to 105, and this is uh, the first part of the answer of the eagle to Dante, and in this first part the eagle gives the faith-related answer. Um, the, the answer that is all, has always been given to this question by the patristic, to, to, by the father of the church, fathers of the church, and that's never really been disputed. Then, starting with uh, verse 106, until the moment when Dante starts uh, listing the various kings and princes, uh, so more or less uh, 115, starting with this ma, at line 106, the eagle moves beyond the simple faith answer and gives to Dante um, a part of an answer that is based on reason and that obviously is based on uh, uh, theology but it's also developed uh, and evolved in, in Dante's mind and in Dante's heart and we're going to see um, completion of this answer in Canto 20 uh, of Paradiso in the next canto. So let's look at this uh, first uh, faith answer, which is from 79 to 105. O terreni animali, o menti grosse, this is line 85, and this is actually an exclamation that Dante uh, sourced directly from uh, Boethius, from his uh, De Consolazione Filosofie. La prima volontà che da se buona, da se che sommo ben, mai non si mosse. This is the point of the matter from a faith point of view. There is no sense in trying to, for us, to try to understand God's mind. This is, in fact, a very ancient answer that God gave to humans. If, if we think about the book of Job, that's part of the conclusion of that book in the Old Testament that God gives. There is only arrogance in thinking that we can see and look through God's mind and, and God's thinking. And that is a very profound Christian truth. But on the other hand, like Dante, we are intellectually curious people. And this in itself sounds a little bit like a cop-out for us because we want to reason around this point. We want to properly understand why this righteous, this very, very good person who is sitting on the bank of the, of the Hindu river might potentially not be saved. Notice how on line uh, 93, with this other simile of the stork, uh, Dante is talking again about uh, the mother stork that gives the food to the little chicks. And, and with this uh, uh, referring to food, he's, uh, he's actually talking again about uh, his uh, fasting, his fasting and his hungering for the answer that the eagle is giving him. So he's keeping everything so well harmonized and so well integrated here, poetically as well. But really, what this uh, reasonable answer is that we are expecting, that, is, that goes beyond the general faith-based answer, has to do with Christ, has to do with Jesus Christ. This is why from uh, 
in, in between these two portions that I indicated, so around uh, line 106, Dante uses another one of his uh, tripartite Cristo rhymes, and so he says, a questo regno non salì mai chi non credette in Cristo. This is one of the fundamental truths of Christianity. In order to be saved, we have to know Christ. This is a fundamental truth. Ne pria ne poi, ne before, not before, not after, che si chiavasse il legno. He was crucified. Ma, and this ma, this but, is really surprising because he moves beyond. He digs deeper. He really digs deeper. Ma, vedi, molti gridan Cristo, Cristo, che saranno in giudicio assai men prope a lui, che tal che non conosce Cristo. So we have already touched a very, very important point. So many are screaming Christ, are going to church and praying and, all, and doing all these acts, but they are much farther away from God than this other person who is very good and righteous and who doesn't know Christ. Isn't this fascinating? And we'll see in a moment that Dante is thinking in terms that are so modern and so genuine and honest um, because still today people are debating this, this issue. However, one of the lesser known parts of the evolution of Christian doctrine is that the Catholic Church today is in line with uh, what Dante is saying here, even if centuries ago maybe somebody could have read this and think and have thought of Dante as slightly heretic. But not today. What does it mean? It means that Dante, as always, he's a, he has a prophetic power and he could see beyond many other people of his times. Dante is thinking in four dimensions here, okay? He's not only thinking about time and uh, as we thought in uh, Canto Four of Inferno, only thinking about Virgil and the classics in temporal times. This is an axis that goes through time. He's also translating this axis horizontally and geographically. For him, it was the easternmost uh, geography. But what's uh, surprising is that in his times, it was not very common that somebody might have not heard about Jesus Christ, at least in his world. Even if they were traveling, there were crosses everywhere and churches everywhere in his world. Um, obviously, much more than what we know and see today in our globalized, multipolar, multicultural world. And yet, he saw through this with such clarity that this became the most pressing and the most important problem for his theology. And he resolved it. And he helps us resolve it as well. In the list of uh, bad princes and bad, um, bad kings that starts with uh, verse 115, and which I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, Dante gives us another beautiful uh, acrostic, which is uh, made by three letters repeated three times each, L, V, and E. And it has to be read as Lue, because V was a U for, for those times, and therefore Lue and Lues was a, a Latin world that, stand, that stood for um, pestilence, for plague, pestilence. That's how it's almost like a, an additional dark cloud over this list of, of bad kings. Beautiful, even because we are in the heaven of justice, and we noticed even from the previous canto how these carefully spelled legalisms are typical of this heaven. Just look how everything is connected, everything in a crazy, crazy way. However, here, I think it's a perfect opportunity to try and extrapolate a little bit from this canto, because what is it that Dante is saying to us? What is it that Dante is saying to us today? Today, it's a problem, this problem of the non-Christian salvation, that uh, has caused the abandonment of uh, Christianity and the Church by many people who have been thinking about it. In fact, these people are probably even more intellectually curious than many so-called Christians. Yes, it has to do with the truthfulness of my religion, of what I believe in, what I give my trust to every day. 
And it also has to do with, with justice, with the justice of God. If justice is not possible at a divine level, how on earth is it possible to have justice here? And so how can we hope for anybody to be able to operate with actual justice? The way that Christianity has looked at this problem throughout the last uh, 2000 years, we can start with St. Augustine, uh, third century, where he was um, willing to follow the hard sayings of the church, especially the Latin saying, extra ecclesiam nulla salus, outside of the church there is no salvation. And uh, he used to take this uh, motto quite literally. So for St. Augustine, there was just no salvation for unbelievers. Then, um, before the 16th century, more or less, the prevailing view in Christian theology was that of St. Thomas Aquinas. If some were saved without receiving any revelation, they were not saved without faith in a mediator. For, though they did not believe in him explicitly, they did nevertheless have implicit faith through believing in divine providence, since they believed that God would deliver humankind in whatever way was pleasing to him. Very fine distinction by St. Thomas between an explicit faith and an implicit faith. This uh, kind of reminds us of uh, a category by, that's been uh, articulated by some uh, theologians of the 20th century. I'm thinking in particular of the Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner. He's considered by many one of the finest theologians of the 20th century. And he accepted the notion that without Christ it's impossible to achieve salvation. However, he could not accept the notion that people who had never heard of Jesus would be condemned automatically. And so he formulated the theory of anonymous Christianity. Anonymous Christianity means that a person lives in the grace of God and attains salvation outside of explicitly constituted Christianity. Let's say that a Buddhist monk or anyone else who, because he follows his conscience, attains salvation and lives in the grace of God. Of him, I must say that he is an anonymous Christian. If not, I would have to presuppose that there is a genuine path to salvation that really attains that goal, but that simply has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But I cannot do that. According to Karl Rahner, a person could intellectually profess this belief, but be existentially committed to those values, to the same values, which for the Christian are concretized in God, in Jesus Christ. In a dogmatic constitution on the, uh, of the Church that's called Lumen Gentium, Article number 19, that's been pro promulgated by Pope uh, Paul VI in 1964, at the end of the Second Vatican Council. In this article, Article 19, the Council says that uh, under certain very specific conditions, salvation is possible for non-Christians. What are these conditions? Mainly, that non-Christians be not culpable for their ignorance of the Gospel, that non-Christians seek God with a sincere heart, and that non-Christians try to live their life in conformity with what they know of God's will. This is commonly spoken of as following the natural law of the light of conscience. So their conscience is the unique mediator. However, it's important to note that under the Christian point of view, this type of life is possible only because, of, because people are moved by divine grace. This is how we reconnect with the concept of Christ that Dante also puts at the center of this uh, exception, of the exception of the non-Christian who is saved. I very often go back to the writings of uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI for any type of questions regarding theology. And so about this theme that Dante so powerfully raised in Canto 19, here is what Pope Benedict has to say, and I'm reading out of uh, his book uh, Il Sale della Terra, or The Salt of the Earth, which is uh, a series of interviews to Pope Benedict. He says, it's absolutely uh, true that somebody can receive from their religion those teachings that can help them become a person that's more pure and honest. And uh, if we want to use this expression, in this way the person can be liked by God more and therefore reach salvation. Religions can sometimes even uh, make it difficult for a person to be good. This can happen, for example, in Christianity as well. 
um, through some false forms or false versions of Christian life or through some kind of sect or uh, reductions. Therefore, in the history of religions, the purification of religion remains always a very important need. So that it doesn't, so that religion, which is a tool in itself, is an instrument, doesn't become an obstacle to the correct relationship with the divine and with God. But in fact, it's a tool, an instrument that can help the human being to walk in their righteous and the right path, in the correct path. And the Pope Benedict continues, if Christianity, uh, starting with Christ, enter history in the history of religions as the true religion, it's, it could actually mean that in the uh, person of Christ appeared the true purifying force, the true purifying strength, in the sense of purifying of religion. It's uh, not always lived by Christians in the right way. This is precisely what Dante was saying in Canto 19. Here is what the Dalai Lama says about this topic. I feel convinced that people who adhere to the spiritual tradition of their parents and live according to its view and philosophy will find that it suits them very well. When it comes to cultivating love, compassion, patience and contentment, or the observance of self-discipline and ethical principles, most spiritual traditions seem to be more or less the same. This is why I feel that from the point of view of their potential to benefit people and help them develop into and grow into good human beings, most spiritual traditions are more or less the same, and this remains my firm conviction. This is a good reason for staying with the religion we have inherited from our parents. Human beings naturally possess different interests, so it's not surprising that we have many different religious traditions with many different ways of thinking and behaving. But this variety is a way for everyone to be happy. If we have a great variety of food, we will be able to satisfy different tastes and needs. When we only have bread, the people who eat rice are left out. And the reason those people eat rice is that rice is what grows best where they live. This is a great simile because religion is a spiritual nourishment, just like food is a, is a physical nourishment. So it's not a matter of uh, thinking about universalism and uh, it's not a matter of uh, pushing towards uh, a stretch, a stretched out syncretism among religions. But uh, for Dante, as well as for me, I have to say, it's a matter of realizing that uh, religion is an instrument and that the real fact, the real truth that doesn't change is the presence of the divine in our world, in our life, and the way that we have the possibility as human beings to connect with the divine because of how we are made, because of how we are wired. Once Dante received this answer from the ego, he is ready to proceed. Uh, we will need uh, uh, some more passages in Canto 20 that I'm hoping to read with you together with another good friend in my next video. So watch this space and uh, uh, Canto 20 will be a lot of fun, I think. And um, thank you very much for watching, as always.